Sir John Dalrymple will receive you now, my lord. The Earl of Bredolden, Sir John. Oh, welcome to the King's House, my lord. It's good to see you in London. I hope your journey from Scotland is not too unpleasant. Thank you, Sir John. I hope all is well with you. Oh, all is never well, Bredolden. You know that better than anyone. Sit down, my friend. I have some news for you. As you know, William is now the king of Ireland, Scotland and England. But his kingdoms here mean less to him than the United Netherlands. It seems to him that Scotland is a troublesome country out of all proportion to its worth. And he thinks of the Highlanders, and I must say I agree with him, as savages and rebels, as well as potential allies for the French. I know that, Sir John. William has spent his life fighting the French. And he probably feels now that his British kingdoms can serve him best by supplying arms and men so that he can continue to fight them. You're right, Brit Alban. But between you and me, William is worried, very worried, because the clans have not yet submitted to him. And another rebellion in the Highlands could ruin his plans for his campaigns in Flanders completely. Ah, I see. Then we must continue to do what we can to get the Highlanders to live in peace. I am a Highlander and a clan chief myself, so I know how unsettled and dangerous conditions are in the North. Even my own lands are surrounded by thieves, blackmailers, and murderers. It is impossible for me or anyone else to cultivate fields properly or improve stock, while bands of armed men go freely about the country, raiding and looting where they please. I would do anything to bring about peace in the Highlands. And I continually pray that King William will allow me to perform some service for him that will help his cause and prove my worth and loyalty to him. I know the King can depend on you, Bert Alban. And I know how powerful you are in the Highlands. That's why I've sent for you. King William has decided to give the rebel clans one last chance. And he has agreed to your suggestion that you meet them and try to reason with them. You will be given 12,000 pounds to divide among the chiefs if they agree to submit to the king and to live in peace. 
If they do not accept this offer, the king will turn to force and bring his armies against them. Gentlemen. Gentlemen, can I now have your close attention, please? I asked you all to come here and be my guest at Haladar, because King William has instructed me to meet with you and to try to come to terms with you for the good and safety of the nation. We are all clan chiefs. We live in the same land and we have the same ambitions. I have sympathy for the cause of King James, just as you have. But King William rules now, and I have given my allegiance to him in order to save myself, my family, and my people from ruin. For your own safety, gentlemen, I ask you to do the same. King William has also authorized me to divide 12,000 pounds among the chiefs who will swear allegiance to him. But we have already sworn allegiance to King James Bredalbin. How can we now, with honor, give it to King William? I must agree with Cole MacDonald Bredalbin. We cannot give our allegiance to two kings. That's true. That's true. But what you both have to learn to accept is that King James is in exile in France, without an army. King William rules here, and his army is on our doorsteps. That is true. We have neither a leader nor the money to fight William's army, unless we can get some help from France. Perhaps we could send a messenger to King James to ask him if he will permit us to submit to William, uh, to save our people. That can be arranged, Lochiel, if you will only agree to live in peace in the meantime. All right. We will send messengers to King James in France immediately. Good. Now, gentlemen, if you'll agree to live in peace until the first day of October, I think we can get down to terms and decide how to divide the money. I will not agree to anything with you, John Campbell. I don't trust you. How can I trust a person who's King James's man one day and King William's the next? My clan follows King James, and we will fight for him again when he needs us. We're not turncoats like you, John Campbell, and I will not help you with any of your scheming. Sit down, McKeon of Glencoe, you thieving, murdering Catalan. How dare you talk of trust? Because of you and the likes of you, we are all thought of as savages beyond the Highland line, and every man's hand is against us. You will accept no authority but the sword. You kill and blackmail and raid and steal wherever and whenever you please. No man's life or property is safe against you. You have stolen my cattle, and you have ruined my crops, and still you dare talk of honor and trust. You behave like a savage, Machian, and one day, I warn you, you will pay for it. Let's go, boys. McKean of Glencoe is not being realistic, gentlemen. I hope you understand that. The King's troops are ready, and I fear before very long, McKean will bitterly regret his anger this night. Well, I must agree with you, cousin. We all know that King William's army is ready, and that he'll turn to force if necessary. Let us now send a messenger to France to ask King James if he will relieve us of our allegiance to him so that we might then give it to William. I will also give you my word that Clan Cameron will live in peace until the first day of October. Thank you, Lochiel. Kepach. Appen. Glengarry. Thank you, gentlemen. I think the King will be pleased with this night's work. In August, however, King William decided to put pressure on the chiefs. He ordered all men who had been in arms against him to appear before the sheriffs of their shires and swear an oath of allegiance before the 1st of January, 1692. Those who refused would be punished to the utmost extremity of the law. 
I've been working for a peaceful and bloodless settlement with the rebel clans for almost a year now. I've waited for three months for them to declare their allegiance to King William. Aye, that's true, Sir John. But don't forget the clans had already given their allegiance to King James. And they are still waiting for his permission to give it now to King William. Well, I've not forgotten anything, Bert Auburn. But there are now only four weeks left till the 1st of January and we've achieved absolutely nothing. Those damned rebels have made me look like a fool. It could take King James forever to make his mind up to discharge them from their allegiance to him. And even if he does, I don't believe they'll take the oath to King William. We must use force to teach them a lesson or we'll never have peace in Scotland. I'm sure, Sir John, they will submit. It just takes someone to break the ice and be the first and then they will all come in. Give them more time, Sir John. No! The madness of these people makes me plainly see there is no reckoning with them. Even if some do take the oath, the Highlanders must be taught a lesson they will not forget. I will have law and order in this land, and I will destroy all the Loch Arbor clans, all the MacDonalds, Stuarts, Camerons and Macleans, if that is necessary to bring them to their senses. The messenger to King James and France has arrived back, Lochiel. Well, bring him in and fetch some wine, you and quickly. Greetings, Lochiel. King James sends us. No, no, sit down and take some wine before you speak. You've had a hard journey. Aye. You may submit to William. King James sends his release to the clans from their oath of allegiance to him. But there are only three days left to the end of the year. King James must know that in winter word cannot be got to all the chiefs so that they can take their oath within a given time. It's too late. As soon as I was given my orders, I left the court and came as swiftly as I could, sir. I know, I know, man. I'm not blaming you. King James never could make up his mind. It seems to get harder for him as he gets older. I must get messengers to the others and leave for Inverera as soon as possible. I should be able to reach there before our time is out. Uh, my man, Ewan, will see to your needs, sir. Please excuse me. Fort William, 30th of December, 1691. Most of the rebel chiefs have now sworn the oath of allegiance to King William, but a few are still holding out. Enter. A Highland gentleman is asking to see you, sir. He says his name is McKeon of Glencoe. McKeon of Glencoe? Show him in. He's an old friend, Lieutenant Lindsay. You may come in now. Greetings to you, Colonel Hill. Greetings to you, McKeon. It's good to see you, my old friend. Sit down. Will you have a glass of wine with me? No, thank you. Colonel, I've come to swear the oath to King William, now that King James has released us from our promise of allegiance to him. Will you administer it that I may now have King William's protection? But I cannot tender the oath to you, McKeon. I haven't got the authority. You must go to the sheriff at Inverera. I'm sorry, but I cannot help you. But some of the others in my glen submitted to you and were given the king's protection. That was six months ago. I still had the authority then. If you do not take the oath from me now, my people and I may have trouble from the government. The time we were given has nearly expired, and the weather is so bad that it will be impossible for me to get to Inverara in time. I'm sorry, McKeon, but there is nothing we can do. The oath must now be taken before the sheriff of Argyle at Inverara. That was made quite clear when the proclamation was posted up in August. You must go to Sir Colin Campbell as soon as you can. I had a bitter argument with John Campbell of Bredolvin at Achaladar, and he threatened me. I fear mischief from him. I also fear the vengeance of the Earl of Argyle, and I would prefer to stay away from Inverara altogether. If you fear Argyle and Bredolvin, then it is even more important that you submit to the king immediately and get his protection. 
Sir Colin Campbell at Inverera is a good man. He will try to help you. But if you do not submit, McKeon, you and all your people will be in the gravest danger. The army is ready, and the king is determined to show no mercy. I will give you a letter to Sir Colin. Take it to him as quickly as you can. God help you. Well, day, gentlemen. Have you travelled far? Aye, we have so. But we're on urgent business. Can you tell me where the sheriff lives? Oh, Sir Colin is not in Inverira. He crossed the loch to see in the new year with his family, and I don't expect he'll be back before the weather improves. But, Sir Colin, I've waited here for three days for you. I was delayed by soldiers and the weather, and still I was at Inverary only two days late. Two days late? You are five months late, McKeon. The law is the law. And even if I accepted your excuses, I cannot administer the oath to you. My authority ended at midnight on the 31st of December. You can read, man, you know that. I'm sorry, McKeon. Colonel Hill means well, but he knows, just as I know, that I cannot take the oath from you now. The King plainly said, no later than midnight on 31st December. Administer the oath to me, and I promise on my honor that I will see that all my people do the same. Those who refuse, you may imprison or send to Flanders as soldiers. Come tomorrow then, McKeon, and it will be done. I cannot promise that the Privy Council will accept the oath, but I will send Colonel Hill's letter along with it to Edinburgh. I will also write myself to ask that you be treated with fairness. Well, gentlemen, I've made up my mind to teach the rebel clans a lesson and to bring law and order to the Highlands. I wrote to the Commander-in-Chief in Scotland this morning. My orders are that the troops posted at Inverness and Fort William are to destroy entirely the country of Loch Arbor. All of Loch Eel's lands, Keppoch, Glengarry, Appin and Glencoe. If you'll excuse me, Sir John, I must say, with respect, that I don't think your proposal is a practical one. To slaughter all of Clan Donald, Stuart, Cameron, and McLean will require a mighty army indeed. I must agree with the Earl of Argyll. It is still a warrior society in the Highlands, and the Clan Jew wished to destroy would make up the most powerful and formidable army in Scotland. And Clan Donald alone would make up a very powerful army, Sir John, and uh, I speak from experience. The Macdonalds and the Campbells have been bitter enemies for generations. I'm aware there's a feud, Argyle, but I don't know how or why it started. Can you tell me that I may understand your people the better? Well, certainly, Sir John. It's uh, not an easy story to tell, but I shall do my best. Once Clan Donald was a truly great and powerful clan. Its chiefs were the Lords of the Isles, and at one time their power rivaled and even threatened that of the Kings of Scots. They ruled the Western Isles from Lewis to South Uist, from Skye to Jura and Isla. They held Loch Arbor, Ardnamurchan and Kintyre on the mainland and in Ireland, the Glens of Antrim. When the King of Scots put down the Lord of the Isles in 1493, the Macdonalds were disunited and their power began to fail. 
Thank you, Argyle. That is a fine brief history of Clan Donald, but you've told me nothing of the feud. No, Sir John, I have not. But, sir, uh, if you will allow me to continue, I shall do so. Yes, of course, Argyle. Please continue. <coughs> like, uh, like most great families, Sir John, the Campbells were at one time a very small and obscure family. But by the careful cultivation of royal favours, the skillful use of law, and of course by strategic marriages, they began to take over the lands of the other clans, especially the lands of the Macdonalds. Now, what we could not get by these various methods, we took by force. As the Campbells grew stronger, the Macdonalds got weaker and weaker, and their hatred of the Campbells became obsessive. Thank you, Argyle. I can see why you have a healthy respect for Clan Donald. But do you really think that the King's army in Scotland is not strong enough to go against Clan Donald, even if we leave the other clans alone for the time being? I do, Sir John. And I urge you to reconsider your plan. What we need, then, is a small clan that we can exterminate in order to frighten the more powerful clans. McKeon of Glencoe came in late. He is the chief of only two or three hundred people. He has very few friends and many powerful enemies. I believe it would be a great advantage to the nation if that thieving tribe were rooted out and cut off. Start. Oh. I see no weapons on them, Lieutenant. They would hide them when they heard we were coming. Go forward with the quartering papers. Explain the situation to that gentleman in front. He is John MacDonald, McKeon's oldest son. Start. Do you speak English, sir? Yes, I do speak English. But Robert Campbell of Glen Lyon there speaks our own language. Now, why does he not speak for you? Do you come to Glencoe as friends or as enemies? On my honor, sir, no harm is intended against McKeon and his people. We have orders signed by the commanding officer at Fort William demanding quarters in Glencoe. Will you read them, sir? Greetings, John MacDonald. I am sorry to impose ourselves on McKeon in midwinter, but it's orders. There's no room for us at the fort because of the gathering of soldiers to march against Glengarry as soon as the weather lifts. But we should only be a burden on McKeon for a day or so before our orders come through to march north. And we should be grateful for whatever quarters you could find for us. You and your men are welcome to Glencoe, Robert Campbell. The soldiers marching into Glencoe are mostly Highlanders. Mungo Diel, Archibald Campbell, Adam McCoy, Alexander Milne, Archibald Blair, Archibald McConney, Archibald Morrison, Archibald McLean, Duncan Campbell, Duncan McCallum, Donald McKinleyroy, Donald Richardson, James McFell, Duncan McCallum, Duncan McLaughlin, Duncan McCarriha, Duncan Campbell, Duncan Robertson, George Campbell, James Campbell, John McDougall, John Dunbar, John McCarriha, John McCulloch, Duncan McNaughton, John Ferguson, 
Duncan McCallum, John McKinley, Duncan Kennedy, John McEachran, John Stewart, John Alexander, Lou Robertson, Malcolm Sinclair, Malcolm McCullough, Malcolm Robertson, Malcolm McLean, Morton McKenzie, Patrick McIntyre, Patrick McEachan, and Robert Petrie. They are commanded by Captain Robert Campbell of Glen Lyon, Lieutenant Lindsay, and Sergeant Barber. Greetings, Inveregan. Greetings, Glen Lyon. Thank you for offering Lieutenant Lindsay and myself the hospitality of your house. We are in your debt. You are both welcome, Glen Lyon, to my house. Use it as your own. I have very little, but what I have is yours. Now come away in and let's have a dram. I cannot trust Glen Lyon, father. You're wrong, Alistair. I'm sure we have nothing to fear from him. But, Father, it's less than three years since we raided his lands, and I know that we ruined him. We left him and his family close to starvation. Aye, he's a poor man now, as well as a fool. But he's also a soldier of the king, and we have the king's protection. But he has good reason to hate us. How can he now come here and live among us? I think the only danger from the soldiers will be to the young unmarried women, and I've sent them away for their own protection. But what about Glengarry, then? Can we not try to warn him that Glen Lyon is to march against him? Glengarry will not be worried about Glen Lyon and his men. He's fortified his castle and he's ready for them. Right, you men, follow me. In there. The rest of you follow me. March! Muskets. Order your muskets. Get in line, you stupid louts. Can't any one of you understand a simple Jesus, order? You bloody insolent dog. I'll teach you to talk on parade. I'll have you flogged to bloody death if you don't shut your mouth and learn to obey orders. Now get in line and stay in line. Right. We'll try it again, you useless. That's no way to treat men, Glen Lyon. Why don't you speak to the brute? It's a difficult situation in Vregan. Sergeant Barber's a good soldier. It's his job to discipline and train the men. But I think you are right. He goes too far. I will have a word with him. Excuse me now, will you? Of course, Glen Lyon. Boys! 
Present. Cock your musket. Fire. Oh, Callum's a great piper. Ah, but you've never seen the hard McKeon's piper. A big, pretty fellow he is, and a bonny, bonny player. Will you hear a tune from your own glens? Uh, no, no, thank you, McKeon. But it's a fine piper you have in my Gaelic boar. Perhaps he can play Gilly Callum for me. Gilly Callum? That is a good idea. Why don't you send for Seamus, McKeon? I will so, my dear. Alistair, will you go and find Seamus and ask him to come and dance with Glen Lion? Yes, I will, McKeon. I charge your glass, Gilad. Thank you, McKeon. You are a kind and generous host. Uh, thank you, John. John, ask your mother if she'll have a drop of brandy. Yes, Father. What's your son of McKeon? Good job, Hamish. Toil in fact of Vitican. Need me some other side, you've a Vitican. A Vitican, go over. And no thank you, McKeon. You have given me a fine dinner and good conversation. I have heard the music of a great piper and seen the best dancing I have ever seen in my life. You have been a good host, McKeon, and I must not impose on your hospitality. Not at all, Glen Lyon. I enjoy your company. If you are tired of the entertainment, let's get the cards out. You're such a good man at the cards. <laughs> Well, McKeon, you know how well I enjoy gambling. And if it is not imposing on you, I should dearly enjoy a game. 
Og þú inn að kastja nálastar. Já, ég sko ekki inn. Tapaði þetta heimir. Það er svo fyrir Henrik. Tapaði ég ekki að hafa sér. Það kemur það. Tapaði þetta ekki inn. Ekki var. Ekki var. Will you excuse me, McKeon? I'm tired. I would like to go to bed. Of course, my dear. Thank you, McKeon. And a good night to you. Good night. And good night to you, Glenlarn. Good night, Lady Glengowen. Thank you for your hospitality and fine company. It is our pleasure. Good night, Mother. She could drop more wine, Glen. Oh, thank you, John. Yes, dear. Yes, yes. We must end this game. Uh, it's getting late. You lean on my shoulder, Glenline, and I will walk with you to your quarters. I can manage, thank you. McKeon? It's Valentin, Lion. Alistair? I can Valentin, Lion. John? I can Valentin, Lion. Thank you, Valid. Why do you tolerate him, Father? He's here almost every night, gambling, drinking himself unconscious. Say good job, Alistair. He can be a bore when he's had too much, it's true. But he usually knows how to behave. He's a weak and broken man, and he's our guest. I still don't trust him. I loathe the sight of him. Let me send him away. No, Alistair, we must put up with him. He's Highland, and he has accepted our hospitality. We have nothing to fear from that poor soul. Come in. Yes, Major Donaldson, sit down. You cannot receive further directions. Be secret and sudden. Be quick. That is the final command from Sir John Dalrymple. He even says he is glad that McKeon was late in coming into the oath. What are my orders, sir? Don't you see? It would be madness to carry out these orders now that the clans are living peaceably. We've had no trouble with them all this winter. McKeon did take the oath. He was only a few days late and was sincere in his submission. What are my orders, sir? You are with 400 of my Lord Argyle's regiment to march straight to Glencoe and there put in due execution the orders you have received from the Commander-in-Chief. Major Duncanson's orders are to carry out the Commander-in-Chief's instructions at seven o'clock the next morning. For reasons of his own, Duncanson changed these orders. Sir, you're here by order to fall upon the rebels, the McDonald's of Glencoe, and to put all to the sword under seventy. You are to have special care that the old fox and his sons do upon no account escape your hands. You're to secure all the avenues that no man escape. This you are to put into execution at five of the clock precisely, and at that time, or very shortly after it, 
I'll strive to be at you with a stronger party. If I do not come to you at five, you are not to tarry for me, but to fall on. This by the king's special command, for the good and safety of the country, that these miscreants be cut off root and branch. See that this is put into execution without feud or favor, else you may expect to be dealt with as one not true to king or government, nor man fit to carry commission in the king's service. Expecting you will not fail in the fulfilling hereof, as you love yourself. I subscribe these with my hand at Balahulish, February the 12th, 1692. Robert Duncanson. Well, gentlemen, my orders have come. We are to march against Glengarry at dawn. There is much to do. Will you excuse me now? Surely, Glengarry. How can I murder these people in their beds, Lindsay? They are unarmed, and we have been their guests for almost two weeks. Our orders state quite clearly what is to be done, sir. You are not Highland, Lindsay. You do not understand our ways. I understand that these people are rebels, and we are soldiers of the king. We came as friends. They trust us, and now we are ordered to kill them. It betrays every Highland law of hospitality, and it is dishonorable. But I must obey the instructions of my king. Prepare the men, Lindsay. Fiona. Fiona, wake up, Fiona. What is the matter, Alistair? I'm worried, Fiona. Lieutenant Lindsay brought Ben Lyon his orders tonight. Ben Lyon then said he was to march against Ben Gary. Why should that worry you, my love? We knew he would be sent against Glengarry. But he said they would be ordered to march when the weather lifted. This weather has been good for ten days. It's bad tonight. It's getting worse. It does not make sense. I'm sure something is wrong, but I cannot think what. I will not be long. But be ready to dress quickly if you hear me returning in a hurry. Or you hear anything at all suspicious. Ready, sir. It's time to carry out our orders. I know that, Lindsay.
McKeon, the soldiers are leaving for Glengarry's country. I wish to thank you for your hospitality and kindness. Give them a dram to keep out the cold, and I'll be down as soon as I can. It's early, but get dressed, and we'll have a dram with them before they go. Go with Ian to the hill and wait for me there. I'll warn John as many others as I can. Hurry! Ah! Wake up! Wake up, John! The lion has been treacherous! Get your children and get out of the house right away! but I can see you are on fire. Ah, I must be seeing things. There is no one there at all. not even see them. And you have failed, Captain Campbell! You've got to beat your orders! Have you made a full report? Aye, a full report. Then read it! Read it for the major.
At five o'clock precisely, as ordered, we set about destroying the people of Glencoe. Alistair MacDonald, chief of clan, known as Mac Ian, was killed, along with 36 of his people. The final figure accepted was 38, a tenth or less of McKeon's people. From London, Sir John Dalrymple wrote to Colonel Hill, All I regret is that any of them got away. The massacre of Glencoe first frightened the rebel chiefs, but in the end, the treacherous means employed did more than any other single event to promote the cause of King James in the Highlands. King William and his government were thereafter distrusted and discredited. Cruel is the snow that sweeps Glencoe and covers the grave O'Donnell. And cruel was the foe that raped Glencoe and murdered the house of MacDonald. We offered them heat, a roof for their heads, dry shoes for their feet. We wined them and dined them, they ate all our meat, and they slept in the house of MacDonald. Oh, cruel is the snow that sweeps Glencoe and covers the grave of Donald. And cruel. Sweeps Glencoe and covers the grave of 